thanks for uh, showing up, everybody. This is Soldering Things with Elixir. So I've been interested in electronics ever since I was a kid, of course. One day I'm sitting down, building out some, some project out of one of those like Radio Shack project books that had all the schematics and all that. And I hook everything up, I flip the thing on, and you know, nothing works. So I check stuff, you know, double check my wiring, all that. That looks okay. I get the multimeter out at one of those cheapo, you know, pocket multimeters. It wasn't that great, but it got the job done. And now I'm not getting the right voltages to stuff. Things are looking dead. So I'm like, man, I must have burned something out. So I start swapping out components, you know, like you'd expect for troubleshooting, and still nothing's working. And you know, I'm I'm basically a noob, so I'm going, okay, well. Maybe I just totally messed this thing up. Maybe I just burned out all my parts. You know, I'm, I'm a kid, so I don't have a lot of money at the time. I don't really want to buy new parts, but I just kind of have to face that fact. I'm like, oh, okay, time to buy new parts. So I go find my mom and say, hey, can you take me to Radio Shack? You know, I need to go buy some parts. And she says, of course. And somehow my brother manages to overhear this, and he gets all excited. And he runs up going, mom, mom, I want parts too. And I'm kind of wondering, like, he's never really shown any interest in electronics, you know, up until this point. But it's like, okay, maybe today is the day where he finally got excited. So I ask him, you know, well, what parts do you want to buy? And he goes, I want a pack of red LEDs. That's a very specific question for somebody who's not really into electronic, or, you know, a very specific uh, response for someone not into electronics. Because uh, you can't really build anything with just a pack of red LEDs, right? You need some supporting components. So I ask him, what are you going to do with a pack of red LEDs? And he said, well, the red ones smoke the best. So yeah, he burned out all my components. <laughs> so my name is Alex. I'm a software developer by day right now. Um, I'm a former control systems programmer. And of course, I love to do hardware by night. Uh, you can find me on the Elixir Slack or on GitHub at A. McLean. So what is soldering? It's basically connecting two metal items uh, together with a filler metal. So those two metal items are like the legs of your components. And you're just adding solder into that joint, and that's what's attaching them together. So one of the things about soldering is that you're not actually like melting the legs of the components, like all your components are just fine. You're just bonding them together, and that's a really good, um, it makes for a really good physical connection as well as an electrical connection. And if you haven't done this before, you might be asking, well, wait a second, isn't that welding? And no, it's not. Welding uses a completely different set of tools. Um, welding works at a much higher temperature, so soldering is essentially like low temperature. Welding's a higher temperature. Welding usually requires a shielding gas and a bunch of other fun stuff. And with welding, you are actually melting the metal of your workpiece. So if you're melding, welding like two pipes together, you are actually melting those pipes and your filler metal and all that stuff. And welding, unlike soldering, also requires eye protection. That's why you see everybody wearing the masks and they weld. Do not look at the arc. So types of soldering. Uh, we've got manual soldering, which is the one that most of you are probably familiar with. That's where you just have the handheld soldering iron. You have your spool of solder. You heat your stuff up with the iron. You push the solder in. It melts. Life is good, right? Then you've got wave soldering. And this is more of like a production process where you actually have a board that's moved with a conveyor belt along this wave of molten solder. So there's pumps that literally generate this wave. And as that wave contacts the board and all the components and the pads on the board and all that, um, that's what's actually doing the soldering work. Uh, something like this is, of course, incredibly expensive. Uh, they're, used, they're really good for production runs because of that, because you get really consistent quality. Um, not so good for a hobbyist. You've got frying pan soldering, which is exactly what it sounds like. Um, if you try that, you probably won't have a happy wife, so I don't recommend it. Um, then there's reflow soldering, and that's, of course, what we're talking about here today. And that's where you use a solder paste, which comes in typically a syringe-like tube. And you add that onto the circuit board. You can either squirt it directly on very carefully, 
or some of the PCB manufacturers, if you have your board made, will actually give you a uh, solder stencil where you can spread the right amount evenly across the board. And this is a sticky paste out of the tube, so that'll actually adhere the components to the board um, and kind of hold them on there while you're, while you're trying to work with it. In reflow soldering, you end up using a controlled heating process, so you put this into the oven, and it follows basically a reflow profile um, because you don't want to add um, uh, like stress to the board. Heating the board up, of course, causes stress. Uh, boards don't like that kind of stress. So you want to have this slow ramp up time here uh, where you bring everything kind of up to a temperature where the board and all the components and everything are happy, but the solder hasn't melted yet. You end up holding that temperature for a while, and that just essentially keeps that circuit board and everything comfortable. And once you, uh, once you reach this time, then you're finally ready to actually melt the solder. And that's when you go up into this reflow part of the profile. And this reflow part lasts for about 10 seconds, and that, that's where that solder paste actually melts, turns to molten solder. And at that point, your, your soldering is good, so then you want to bring the temperature back down so that you just don't overheat the rest of your components on the board and burn them out and that stuff. So the problem I was having is manual soldering is, of course, a time-consuming process because you have to sit there and hit every single pad with the soldering iron, and if you're trying to do a lot of work, it just takes a while. It can be difficult to manually solder some parts, so like this, um, this example of a chip I have up here is a ball grid array. It's physically got those pins underneath the chip, so it's really difficult to get the chip on the board and get a soldering iron under there, of course, right? So. There are some tricks where you can do that in manual ways, but it's, it's difficult. Um, Small-scale commercial reflow ovens were available at the time when I built this project. I think it was about two years ago. Uh, they were expensive, though. They were in the low-ish thousands of dollars, I think two to 4,000-ish. So not really a good thing to, to just jump into to experiment with it to prove the concept. Uh, I wanted to try something that was a little bit cheaper to start with and then if I got stuff going, then I could you know, scale up to there. And of course, the most important point, I needed an excuse to go try nerves. So I'd been working with it a little bit before, but I needed like a real project uh, to actually try to use it with. And I decided to use this as the, that candidate for it. So the goal behind this project was for me to be able to efficiently solder lots of components onto a board, basically for prototyping and small scale production type runs. I really wanted to avoid third party PCB assembly costs because for those small runs, they can do it, but you end up paying um, basically more in tooling costs for them to start the process up than you do you know, for the board. So you're, you're already paying you know, 100 bucks or so just to start your run up anyway. So if you're just trying to do one to 10 boards assembled, it's not that cost effective. Um, so I set out to create a low-cost reflow soldering oven. So let's talk product design, because how do you go about you know, actually getting this concept out there? So the first question is, what kind of device is not only expensive, but that you can also heat up to about 200 degrees Celsius to be able to melt that solder? And of course, this is cheating, because you all get to see it here before I do the reveal, but the toaster oven. <laughs> um, this is by no means a novel idea either. There are plenty of people, if you go searching the web, that have done uh, reflow solder toaster ovens. But I hadn't noticed anybody do it with nerves yet, or at least at the time when I built this. So I thought that would be a cool little twist to this. So then how do we control the heating elements inside that oven because we need to turn them on and off and follow the reflow profile and all that. And so we've got some relays on a board here that we're able to wire up uh, to there, and that just allows us to control the, that high voltage side with a low voltage from the controller. And then how do we measure the temperature throughout the reflow process? I've got two thermocouples inside the oven here, and that's just a picture from actual, actually the inside there, so you can um, come up and see it at the end. And there's a um, basically like a tin and a, um, a tray and a PCB, you know, the PCB that you're trying to solder that sits in the middle there, um, kind of between these two. So there's one that's taking readings of the temperature from the bottom, there's one that's taking readings of the temperature from the top because there can be kind of these heat pockets because um, there's a bunch of stuff in the middle. 
And then how does the user control the product? Uh, that's pretty simple from a small embedded project like this. Let's just add some push buttons on and maybe let's throw a LCD screen on there for uh, you know, the user to be able to see stuff. And then how do we coordinate all these systems? So I chose to use a BeagleBone Black. I'm basically a big fan of the BeagleBone. That's one of the reasons why. Uh, it's one of the platforms that will run Elixir and Nerves out of the box. So Nerves does have like official support for some boards. The BeagleBone's one of them. Of course, Raspberry Pi is another. Uh, cool thing about the, Beagle uh, the BeagleBone Black is that it's TI's evaluation platform for their Satera processors. So even though you can use this in a lot of hobby projects, it's something you can also take to production if you want to. So the, uh, they give you, um, it's all open hardware. They give you reference designs. Um, that makes it very manufacturing friendly. So you can take all the parts on this board uh, they give you all the information of how this was built. You can put it on your own board, brand it under your name, make it look however you want to, um, and you're shipping then essentially a beagle bone on your own hardware. So it, your product doesn't actually have to look like this in this form factor. So that's kind of a cool thing with beagle bone. So the major components, just to recap of this system, are we've got the toaster oven, we've got some sensors, which are just those thermocouples, we got the relays to control the heating elements, uh, user interface, which are just those buttons, and we got the controller tying everything together. For those of you who are into system diagrams, we've got, this is kind of like the next level uh, deeper from that. So we've got the CPU down here kind of controlling everything. We got a start button that'll kick off the process. We have our relays um, connected up to the high voltage side, talking to the heating elements over here, or sorry, controlling the heating elements over here. Uh, thermocouples down here with their A to D converters um, so that we can actually have them talk to the CPU. And uh, of course, some other fun stuff in there too. Uh, for any of you who are into schematics, I do have the schematics posted on the repo for this. Uh, I just didn't include them in the presentation. So product operation. Uh, really, really simple for a user to control this thing. Uh, push the start button and then get a board that comes out the other end. So this was, uh, this was either the first or second board that I ran through this. And uh, it came out looking pretty good, uh, I would say. I had no idea how much solder paste to actually put on this, so it was just trial and error. Uh, I did get a couple little solder bridges there, so oops. Um, but those wick right off with solder wick. So uh, it was a success, and those boards are sitting up here on, uh, on this breadboard, if you want to take a look at those at the end. So let's talk firmware, because as the Elixir you know, programming group, this is probably what you guys want to see, right? So like I said, I used NERVS for this project. And NERVS is essentially a framework for creating embedded systems with Elixir. Uh, there's a couple different sides of NERVS. And one thing you get from using NERVS is the development tools. So you have that Elixir development framework, so you can actually write uh, Elixir code just like you'd be used to for writing, say, a web app and it'll actually run uh, on your embedded system. You've got all the mix, mixed tasks around that like you'd expect uh, from an Elixir ecosystem, uh, which will assist you with various um, tasks for working with the board. Uh, it will handle cross-compiling for you so you don't have to worry about your desktop, which is probably an x86 system, trying to work with um, your target hardware, which is probably an ARM system. So uh, they've... Uh, basically coupled the tooling together, so NERVS will take care of that side of things for you. It'll also take care of firmware management for you, so you can, uh, you can save images, burn images to your SD card. You've got over-the-network firmware transfers, um, and they'll also take care of um, like AB firmware images, so you can actually push firmware uh, to, uh, to your embedded device if you need to. It'll, record, it'll be running off, say, the A partition. Uh, it'll, put, it'll save the new firmware to the B partition. And if for some reason it fails to boot into B, it'll fall back over to A so you haven't bricked your device. So I didn't use that for this project, but it is a really cool feature of NERVS if you need to have a more robust system. You also get portability with NERVS, which is pretty awesome. So by this, I mean, I wrote this specific project for BeagleBone, but if I wanted to support, or for the, for the BeagleBone Black, if I wanted to support also like the BeagleBone Green or a Raspberry Pi, I can support those devices as well um, using NERVS. So I can target 
multiple hardware for the same project. With NERVs, you also end up getting a runtime with it. And so this is what's actually running on the board when you're running a NERV system. So the first step is you've got a bootloader, which in uh, the BeagleBone Black it uses U-Boot to boot it up. And so this is the thing that gets you uh, from power on, essentially into Linux. The version of Linux uh, that NERVs ends up building uh, uses BuildRoot, and it's targeted specifically for the hardware you're using. So that's kind of opposed to if you're using like a, a Linux distro, say Ubuntu, or you might have also heard of like Yocto for embedded systems. And those are, um, those are more heavyweight. They end up giving you like a package manager and a bunch of other tooling and system things that come with it. They're a little more heavyweight. So what you get with the Nerve side of things is a build root image that's uh, build root Linux image that's designed directly for your hardware. So that's kind of cool. From there, once Linux boots, you're booting directly into the Beam VM as process number one. So in a Linux environment, your first process is usually like supervisor D or whatever your, your init system is going to be that's actually going to monitor all the other processes running on the system. So the cool thing about this is Erlang is essentially running and monitoring your entire system. Um, which is kind of cool because Erlang has all the you know, OTP stuff that, uh, that's really good for dealing with this. And then after that, your application uh, is just an OTP application that's running right on top of that Beam VM. So you kind of got the four layers there of how the runtime works. Creating a new project is incredibly easy with NERVs. It's mix NERVs new. You specify your app name uh, that you just want to call your project. And you can specify a target in the command line as well. And that's just which hardware you actually want to run your NERVs uh, project on. And so we're just using BBB for BeagleBone Black there. Little disclaimer is this project, like I said, is about two years old. I think it's running on NERVs 0.7, something like that. NERVs is now up to, I believe, 1.4. So there are some discrepancies now. Um, but for the most part, the concepts are the same. They've, they've made things a lot easier. Um, between now and then. I've started up a new NERVs project on the side, and they've done some cool things. So definitely check that out. So part of this system generation um, will give you a, a mix file, of course. And you've got a, a target, and that's going to be where your program is actually running. So out of the box, you get host, because it's really convenient to have a place to be able to run your tests and stuff locally, because you don't want to be burning an SD card and plugging it into your device and then having the device run the tests and going through that slow process. Yeah, fun. So they give you host, and that, that lets you do that kind of fun stuff. You can use that for CI, um, you know, any kind of automation like that that you want to do as well. And then you actually have your, uh, your hardware target, so in this case, BBB for BeagleBone Black. And that's going to compile down the system for the actual target hardware you want to run it on. And like I said before, you can, you can set up nerves to compile for multiple targets. Further down in that mix file, you're also going to have a NERV system. And so this is going to be um, basically what configures your hardware to boot up into NERVs. And this is going to be that, that thing that BuildRoot ends up building. So the NERVs maintainers conveniently give you um, a NERV system for all the supported uh, hardware that you can run NERVs on. If they don't support something or you need to customize a system, you can certainly do that. There's plenty of documentation on how to do that. Uh, one catch is if you're using one of the supported systems out of the box, they conveniently cache all of those images for you. So instead of having to wait like the 30 minutes for Linux to compile on your system, uh, when you do uh, mix depths.git, it'll pull down that cached image and everything works a lot faster. So just a little disclaimer, if you have to compile your own system, it might take a little longer. So then you've also got dependencies, of course, in your mix file. And one of the little changes here when you're working with a NERV system is you've now got host dependencies and target dependencies. And of course, everything up here is your shared dependencies. But you need this because on your board, you're obviously going to have different, uh, different like I.O. and different things you can work with on your hardware that aren't available on your development machine, right? So you don't want to load up. Um, some serial driver or some, uh, some I.O. interface or something on your 
on your uh, development computer that, that doesn't exist there because either you're not going to use it or it's you know, going to crash because it can't find the hardware, right? So this is a part of the mix file that actually uh, lets you take care of separating out those dependencies so that you're only pulling in the, the you know, dependencies you need for your hardware when you're actually trying to build the hardware. So some of the libraries that were used in this project are Elixir Ale, which is one of the major ones, and that's going to control like the GPIO, which is just general purpose input output, flip a pin on, flip a pin off. It's that simple. Um, and also in this project, the spy bus, and that's a serial communication bus for just chips on the board to be able to talk back and forth with a serial protocol. So you can use this. Um, I'm using Elixir Ale in this project to control the push buttons, the relays, the thermocouples, and that kind of stuff. Uh, recently, Elixir Ale um, has been superseded by circuits. Um, so just a little difference with the, um, if you're building a new NERVS project there. We've got NERVS network in this project, which is gonna manage the wired and wireless networking. So there's an ethernet port on this board. I wanted to use it. This is what enables that port. And we've also got NERVS NTP, which, you know, from the software side, you're probably thinking, well, why is clock synchronization that big of a deal? And the catch is when you're working with these, these lower cost embedded systems, you actually don't usually get a real time clock on the board. So as soon as it loses power, it forgets what the time is. So I'm using NERVS NTP here, uh, mostly to do that clock initialization. So when it powers up, it looks for the network connection and just pulls the time down from, you know, from some public time servers. Uh, NERVS NTP has also been superseded by NERVS time recently. So we'll go over the software uh, architecture here of what's actually going on inside Elixir for this project. And so we've got our NERVS base layer down here that we're starting out with. And we've got those libraries, NERVS network, NERVS NTP. And then I've got this little glue logic um, for the network up at the application level. Uh, I'm just going to gloss over that for the presentation because in some of the newer libraries, um, I believe you don't even need that anymore. And then we've got Elixir Ale. And so that's where most of the fun happens because that's all our I.O. So sitting on top of Elixir Ale, we've got the push buttons, we've got the relays. Uh, we have a little adapter for dealing with the spy bus because we have to abstract a little bit of logic out just to make the application a little easier to write. Uh, we're talking to the thermocouples through the chips on that spy bus, so that's why we're using that. And then we've just got the controller that's tying everything together. So a bit of what the simplified uh, file structure of this project looks like is we've, of course, got config.exs, and then we drop into the library files, and we've got the application, the buttons, the relays, spy, thermocouple, controller, basically all those major components that, that I just went over. So jumping into the config.exs file, this is a really good place when you're working on a hardware project like this to be able to do a little abstraction to separate out where, where your devices are actually plugged in, like which, which pins on the um, embedded hardware you're using. And so here I've got those, those pin numbers of the actual BeagleBone Black. And then I'm just assigning some names that make sense in the business logic so that number one, I don't have to remember when looking through the code like, like what the heck is pin number 67 and see that everywhere. So I can actually make some you know, sense about reasoning through the code and understand you know, what it means. And of course, the other thing is if you have to make a bunch of changes, like say you hook something up differently on the board or you need to move things around, you don't have to do like a giant find and replace through all of your files and change all that. You just drop into the config file change where the, uh, you know, where the pin is hooked up and you're good to go. Uh, here you can also see, you know, I'm configuring like the time servers and all that good stuff. So taking a look at the application.ex file, this will look pretty familiar here. So we're just using applications. So this is an OTP application. Uh, we're doing, you know, some aliasing. We've got the OTP start method. We're spinning up some uh, processes, uh, some gen servers under a supervisor and starting the supervisor. And that's about it. So the cool thing about this is when you're working on an embedded system like this, it's just another OTP application, really. It's all the stuff that you're probably already familiar with. 
Taking a look at the buttons, so this is where we're getting some I.O. into the system and we're trying to listen to see whether a user has pushed the button or released the button. Uh, we're using Elixir Ale and the GPIO module of that to be able to do this part. And so we're assigning the pins, or we're, we're pulling out the pin numbers from that uh, config.exs file, uh, just to link those up to some friendly names here. And then when the gen server starts, we're just configuring those pins as inputs. And then we're setting some interrupt handlers down here so we can just capture uh, whether we're getting events on the rising edge, so you've pushed the button, or a falling edge of the signal, the user's released the button. And then, of course, just shoving some state into a gen server. So one of the little differences you might see here that might look a little funky is def start. Uh, that's, I, I was experimenting around with xactor, um, that library when I was doing this. I don't have a definitive conclusion on whether I like it better than just doing things the standard way or not. Um, but I just thought I'd point out that is why it looks different. It just kind of uh, is some convenience wrappers around gen server. So down here, we're actually doing a, a handle info on one of those GPIO interrupts. And all we're doing is uh, a little pattern matching here, just like you'd expect. And so we're just capturing the pin number and the edge of that signal, rising edge, falling edge. And then we're just converting you know, those buttons into some, uh, those button events into some friendly names and doing a little logging here so we can take a look at what's going on and publishing that out to some uh, listeners that are subscribed to these events. Then we've got the oven relays, which is essentially just the opposite of what's going on with the buttons. So the buttons were accepting input, the oven relays were just dealing with output. So this is gonna look very familiar. And then when we get over to actually initializing these pins, we're just gonna initialize them as outputs instead of inputs, and then dump a bunch of state into the gen server. One of the things I've done here with those relays is just broken out some of that business logic into some friendlier names so you're not, uh, you know, you're not working with those pins, you're not directly and stuff like that. So for this project, I'm just saying, uh, just defining a function, is the top element active? And you set it true to turn that top heating element on and false to turn it off. And same thing with the bottom one. So just really simple wrappers around some control logic there. And then some more of the fun stuff, dealing with the spy bus, because now we have to deal with communication. So we've got those, uh, those two thermocouple chips, which are actually sitting here. And so it's got serial data coming into the chips, and then the actual thermocouple side is analog. So we got to get the data off of that digital bus somehow. And SPY is going to let us do that. So one thing uh, that will kind of look familiar to the other files up here is that we're actually dealing with a CS0 and CS1 pin again. The way that SPY works is not only do you actually have the serial data that you transfer over a couple, couple wires, but multiple devices can actually share the same bus. So this is just a way to identify um, which chip you actually want to talk to, and that just uh, triggers a, another pin on that chip. Um, so when you drop it low, that's just the controller's way of saying, hey, chip, I want to talk to you. And then when you raise it high again, that's how it knows you're done. So this going on here is just a simple way to be able to address those two different chips on that same bus. So then we've got enable spy hardware. And this is a sneaky little thing you can do with the BeagleBone here when it's initializing. And you can see down here, we're just we're writing to some system file and uh, we're, we're writing some kind of, you know, just little text value into that to make it do something. So the BeagleBone, as well as some of the other complex um, embedded systems like this have pin multiplexing. So you actually have a whole bunch of different peripherals on that board or on the actual CPU that you're able to access, but there aren't enough pins that are actually coming off this board to be able to get to all of them. So you gotta be able to choose what you wanna be able to access. And by default, the spy bus is turned off uh, for that, or it's not exposed through those pins. So we're just calling this to be able to say, we want to be able to use the spy bus on some of these pins, and then it flips four of those pins to being able to use that bus, and then we're good to go. So that's just doing a little initialization so we have the bus available to the rest of the hardware. 
And then of course, we're just setting those chip select pins to outputs because that's what we need to be able to talk to the other, um, those thermocouple chips. So now that we've got the bus initialized, we need to be able to do some kind of data transfer to be able to get the data from our controller down the SPI bus to the chip and back again. So I've just got a transfer method here, or a function here. And then it's just gonna take the address of what we wanna to talk to, and I got to make up how we define the address for this project. And then it's just gonna take the, day the payload of data. Now down here, we've also got received data. And that might seem a little weird for a function that's going to be sending some data, but this is a transfer, and SPI transfers synchronously. So every message you send on the SPI bus, you always get one message back as well. And it just always works that way. So regardless of whether we want to be the transmitter or whether we want to be the receiver, we always have to send one packet, even if it's just bogus data. And then we're always going to get one packet back. So that's why we're capturing the received data. So diving into some of those functions, this is how we're converting the address um, to those uh, PIDs in the gen server that we're actually using in um, Elixir Ale. And I just decided to use a bus ID and a chip select ID as the address. We're just using a tuple for those. Uh, if you saw back here, the BeagleBone actually has a second spy bus as well if I wanted to use it. So I just left this open so we actually have a bus ID if I ever wanted to turn the other one on in the future. And the chip select ID we have available if we need to add any other chips onto that SPI bus. We've got a way that we can extend the system. And then dispatch down here is doing more of that low level logic of actually doing the communication to the chip. So this is where we're going to pull that chip select pin low, uh, which says, OK, I want to be able to, uh, I'm, I'm, as the master controller, I'm ready to send a message to you. And then we're going to transfer a payload down that SPI bus. And since it's synchronous, we're also going to receive some data back. And once we've got that data, we're just going to set the chip select high again and say, hey, we're done with this SPI transaction. So now we can go into the thermocouples, which are actually using that SPI bus. And up here, we've just got those addresses, like you saw from the other function, where we're just addressing the top and bottom uh, thermocouple A to D converters. And this is a pretty simple interface there where I've just got a value of function. Where once we're up in that controller level logic, we've just taken this up to some high level logic we can actually work with in the, in the application itself. We can just say, hey, I want the value of the top thermocouple or the bottom one. And if you chose an invalid one, of course, Elixir pattern matching on the function here is just going to blow up and your, your program is going to crash and it's going to restart itself. So we're just taking that thermocouple address. Uh, here, we don't actually care about sending those thermocouples any data because we don't need them to do anything. We're just monitoring temperature. So we're just going to send some 32 bits of just some dummy data down the wire because we don't really care what it does. And we're going to get that temperature, uh, or we're going to get that data packet back off of the thermocouple converter, uh, A to D converter there. And then we're just going to decode it. And we've got some other things that come back with this as well. Um, we're able to do a little air handling because the thermocouple chips I use are able to detect whether it's plugged in correctly um, and some other little air conditions like that. So we're just able to take care of that here as well too. So ignore that part for a second. And we're over here in decode temperature. And this is where Elixir's binary pattern matching will make very quick work of binary protocols like this. So we're able to take uh, the temperature itself, and that's just a 14-bit integer. So we're just able to binary pattern match that. We're going to ignore a couple of these other values that come back in. And then these are some of our fault conditions that that thermocouple A to D chip is able to report to us as well. So we're going we're gonna to capture those and um, raise some errors down here if, if any of those error conditions uh, happen to occur. And so now you might be wondering, how do you actually know how to decode this message? Where do you actually get these values from? And the simple answer is, look at the data sheet for the chip. So those thermocouple A to Ds are the max 31855s. 
And you don't have to like read the entire data sheet right now, but right down here, it'll tell you, uh, here are all the, the bits of that payload that comes back and it describes exactly what they do. And it tells you what the output is that you're gonna get for all these different temperature values. So you've got a description of the entire data you're gonna get back and how to do any like conversions on that if you need to convert some of these numbers. So at that point, we're up into the controller logic itself. And now that we've basically abstracted our hardware away into, into business logic at this point, it makes things a lot easier to work with. So we typically don't even have to worry about flipping bits and stuff anymore at this level. We can just think in terms of, um, of how the system actually needs to run. So to start this off, you can see we're just gonna handle the info of the start button press because that's what we need to kick the entire process off. And we're just doing a little state machine stuff down here. So if the system happens to be in the idle state and it's ready to start the job because it's not doing anything, we're gonna start the job. And if it already is in the middle of the reflow process, we're just gonna ignore the press to the start button. So now we can dive into actually starting the job up. And what I've done here is just got a little CSV capture running. So I'm just using some of the file storage on the system to be able to log what's happening. And you can see we've also got some console output going on there too. So if you're watching in the terminal, you can actually see the, the process happening. Starting the timer is one of the important things we end up doing because the reflow process being a time-based process, we need some way to kind of iterate through that and track it. So instead of having the user you know, having to check in, we're just working with a timer to automatically handle that. Uh, we're logging some measurements. And then the next step of starting the job, of course, is turning on those heating elements because we need those going. There does happen to be a fan in the side of this thing as well. I'm using that for, um, for some cooling on the side. So at the start of the process, we're just making sure that fan is turned off as well, uh, just in case, because we don't want it blowing things around on the board or anything like that when all those little components are just stuck in, you know, carefully stuck in place there. So up here, now that we've started the job, we're just waiting for those timer events and logging the measurements. And then we're just doing some state machine stuff here. So working from the top down, uh, we've gone, if you remember that re reflow profile, we've kind of gone up, we've, we've gone over because we've started the job and we're going to have raised up to that reflow point, which was um, here, we're, we're looking for 215 degrees Celsius and we're making sure that we're in the running state so that we're not actually shutting things down or you know, in the wrong step of the process. Um, so we're waiting to hit 215 degrees Celsius. We know that the solder is gonna be melted at that point and we wanna start cooling things down. So if the user is watching the terminal, this is kind of one of the problems with any reflow toaster oven project is you actually need to open the door because the thing doesn't cool down fast enough. Um, so it just prompts the user uh, to open that door. And then we're gonna go into a passive cooling state. And I named this passive because the fan's not gonna turn on yet. Um, so we don't want the fan to turn on yet because if you remember the diagram, we're up at the high point of the temperature, the solder is still molten. So if we turn the fan on, it might be possible to blow chips out of alignment a little bit or things like that. You know, the solder's not, not quite solidified. So we're just gonna keep the fan off, turn the heating elements off, tell the user to open up the door and let things cool down a little bit just passively for, for a bit. Um, it actually happens relatively quickly. Uh, and then we're gonna wait for that temperature to drop below 180 degrees. And at that point we can be pretty confident that nothing's gonna be moving around on the board anymore. The, the solder is gonna be hardened. So at that point we can go into forced cooling and actually turn that cooling fan on uh, because it will take the thing just a little while to cool itself down um, where it's safe to actually be able to touch things in there. So then we're just checking, um, we've got the two thermocouples in there. So we're just making sure the top temperature and the bottom temperature out of those two thermocouples are 35 degrees, which is safe enough to be able to touch anything you know, inside that oven you've been working on. Um, and we'll just stop the job and let the user know that, you know, job's done, your board's ready. So one of the interesting things with 
hardware, of course, is you don't have the physical hardware available on the system that you're developing on. So one of the caveats having to unit test things is you're going to end up having to mock a lot more stuff than you might have to in other applications. And maybe you have to get, yeah, you, know, you don't have, um, like I showed with the, the split dependencies between the host and the target, you might not actually have some of your dependencies uh, actually loaded onto your host. So you might have to work around that. Uh, I did this with mocks in this project. If you're a functional purist, um, you know, don't don't look. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm actually playing around with some more pure ways to do that in the latest project, but I honestly don't have a good answer on that at this point. So I used mocks. Um, so you can see that here. I just used eSpec to do this, and you can see I've I'm setting up some mocks here. I am expecting expecting some mocks to trigger, and that's testing. Uh, and other than that, it's just you know pretty much the same old business logic that you saw in the rest of the code. So nothing too surprising there. Another thing to consider um, that I've recently realized when working with a NERVS project is that because you don't have those libraries and stuff available on your host anymore when you're doing, um, when you're doing the tests and compiling the code and stuff like that, you have to think about the dializer code path a little more if you're, act if you're using the dializer. So if you've compiled for your host and then you just run dialyzer and you're not, you don't have all those libraries and you've got a bunch of your, um, your dependencies just like mocked, like if you didn't mock them and you actually like removed them from that part of the code with like if, if statements and stuff in your code and you just flat out didn't load that stuff, um, the dialyzer is not gonna know it's there. So I've, that's something to consider. I've been playing around more recently with actually running the dialyzer on um, the compiled version of the code for the hardware. So that's just something to think about and take into consideration. Writing firmware to the SD card is surprisingly easy. So you've got this mixed target environment and vari in environment variable that you set just BBB here for BeagleBone Black. That's going to tell Nerves, hey, I want to compile it for the BeagleBone. And like you saw from the mix file, we actually have this mix target defined. So that's how Nerves knows how to do its thing there. And just a simple mix command of firmware burn. And it's done. It just asks for pseudo privileges, and you type your password, and it burns your program to a SD card, and it's ready to stick into the device. And you turn the device on, and it boots up. So that's a cool bit of magic. IEX is available um, on your target hardware, which is really cool. Uh, you know, you're probably used to using that, of course, a lot for doing Elixir development. So you do have it available on your running target hardware. It's available in a couple different ways. Uh, the way I like to use it is over the serial port, um, which on the Beagle Bone, it's actually this tiny little like five pin header up here. Uh, you do have to have a special cable to attach to that. But if you're pulling the power on it and stuff like that, you don't lose your connection on the port like you do with USB. Uh, the NERVS documentation does have a way to configure these different options if you don't want to use the default one. The default one is to get your IEX shell over USB, and that just happens when you plug the board in with USB. Um, uh, I believe there's a mix command to do that. I'm kind of fuzzy on that now because I don't really use it, but it is available. And they do have an SSH package available as well so that you can actually SSH um, and get IEX that way. One thing to know with working with NERVS is there is no shell. So there's, there's no you know, Linux shell like SH or Bash or anything like that running. Uh, one of the ideas behind that is, number one, you're working on a small embedded system. It, you know, you want to kind of limit that profile. So you don't want a bunch of extra stuff you know, sitting there either running or just available for you know, people to get into or just taking up mem you know, memory or disk space as well. Another philosophy around that is that Typically, what you're going to do is your, your setup and build of the system on your host. So you're going to configure everything you want, you know, uh, the way you want the system to run on your host, and then you're going to push that over to the board. So by the time you get to the board, you shouldn't need the shell for too many things. Now, one example of where you may want it is you saw I was writing out some CSV files. So in that case, you know, yeah, you might actually make want to make sure that like your files were written to your disk on the device without having to plug everything into your computer and all that. So NERVS does emulate some of the basic shell commands in IEX. 
um, when you're using nerves. And so you get like ls and some of those simple commands like that that you can at least use to inspect the file system and some of those things. So getting started with hardware, enough about talking about what I've done here with this project and a little more on to what you can expect to get into if you want to grab a board and start experimenting. So some of the differences between hardware and software development I think are important to go over because if you're coming from the software side, there can be maybe either some traps or some things you're not you know, naturally expecting when you start working with hardware. And so like you've seen in this project, some of those things are the hardware specific features of, um, of your actual hardware. So one of the things in this project was like physical I.O. Uh, you could be dealing with uh, hardware accelerated um, processing, uh, like hardware accelerated modules on your chip that just aren't on your development machine. And uh, cryptography is one of the good examples of this. Like a lot of the smaller platforms, uh, embedded platforms now are coming with like AES encryption for Wi-Fi and things like that. Um, your computer's obviously got Wi-Fi built in, but that's just an example where on the smaller devices, they are actually hardware accelerating that. There is specifically physical hardware in the chip that does that. Um, and you know, your laptop or your development system isn't gonna have that. Floating point's another one to take into consideration too. The BeagleBone, I believe, does have a hardware floating point processor. So if you're using that, you know, floats, everything should be fine. Um, I think the Pi has that too. I'm not much of a Pi guy, so don't quote me on that, but I think the Pi probably has it. Uh, but there are some boards that don't support hardware floating points. So if you needed to use floats on that, it has to be done in, basically the compiler is gonna software emulate it and things around that might go slower. Probably. It, it wouldn't surprise me if it did. Um, we've got device tree, which you got to see a little bit of. So you've got the pin multiplexing that you have to deal with, um, with some of the more sophisticated pieces of target hardware. Uh, so just to be able to configure those pins, you might have to get into the v device tree or you might have to write to one of those files like I showed here to be able to expose the pieces of hardware that you actually want to use. And of course, the uh, mocking the hardware, that might be um, slightly different than maybe what you're used to having to do, uh, especially with that split dependency tree. You've got CPU architectural differences. So like I touched on a little bit, your development machine is probably an x86 system. The uh, target hardware is most likely an ARM system. You can't just take a program compiled on one and run it on the other because they're completely different instruction sets. The chips don't know how to deal with it. So you have to deal with cross compiling and, and that kind of stuff. But uh, like I said, NERVS helps you out with that as well. And I also touched on uh, if you do end up having to compile your NERVS system, or basically if you ever have to touch build root, just be prepared for it to go really slow. So some of the other differences are when dealing with the hardware, you're in a much more resource constrained environment than you're probably used to when you're developing software. So if you're working with like a laptop or something like that, you know, you've probably got 16 or 32 gigs of RAM and a couple gigahertz to work with and, you know, plenty of disk space and all that good stuff. Uh, once you go over to a smaller piece of hardware like the BeagleBone, you've got uh, like 512 megs of RAM, around a gigahertz of, of processor speed. Uh, I believe it's like 4K of onboard flash memory to be able to use, and then whatever size SD card you can cram into the thing. So, you know, things, things are a lot smaller, but one of the you know, flip sides of that is your device is actually running a targeted piece of software. So uh, you can leverage that to only do that specific task very well. And some of those constraints you, you might not notice anymore. But um, yeah, this is, this is probably the wrong group for, but you know, you're, you're not gonna be like dropping your Rails app on something like this anytime soon, right? You know, it's gonna be too big. Uh, Phoenix, by the way, just because I mentioned that, Phoenix totally runs on this stuff. So if you've got a Phoenix project or something like that, you wanna port over to this, it runs, you know, Phoenix, Cowboy, any of that web server stuff, you can totally run on one of these, uh, on a nerve system. So, you know, check that out, something to think about. One of the other gotchas here is working with a read-only root file system. 
I believe Nerf sets this up for you out of the box, but one of the reasons why this is really important on an embedded device is that you could lose power at any time, right? So one of the things you don't want to do is be in the middle of a file write, especially if it's a file write to your operating system, lose power and have your OS corrupted and brick your device and, and that. So typically, especially if you're doing any kind of uh, production hardware, your root file system is going to be read only. So you know your device is always going to be able to boot back up at least. And if you do end up needing to write files like I did in this project, uh, those end up going on another partition and you know you can you can kind of deal with any corruption issues or stuff like that that happen on more of a case by case basis or at least a more targeted basis. Another cool thing with uh, hardware is you can actually go into hard and soft real time requirements for systems. Think about like, this is like if you're trying to build like a CNC machine or anything with robotics or stuff like that, where you need really precise timings, really precise movements of like motors or other actuators or things like that. Um, hard, uh, hardware can give you those really precise timings where something like your your preemptive uh, operating system is, you know, gonna go to sleep so that the user can go watch YouTube or something, and it's gonna wake back up your process whenever it feels like it, right? So. Uh, if you were trying to do like C, you know, control C and C directly on that, you know, maybe your drill bits moved over and like has ruined your workpiece at this point because the OS like couldn't actually handle the, the timing requirements. Nerves itself um, is running on Linux, so that is all preemptive. Um, you're not going to get hard real time out of Nerves. Just fair warning. But uh, that Grisp two board that's coming out does have a, uh, a a hard real time option if you're doing the Erlang side of things. And I have a sneaky suspicion since it's running the BM, there's probably a way to get Elixir into that, compiled into that side of things. Um, but the Nerves route is going to be using that, that build root uh, version of Linux. And of course, hardware can fail if it's wired up incorrectly, as you heard from my story at the beginning. So that might be one of the things if you're just getting into hardware that, you're, that you might be really concerned about. That's something I've heard from people is, yeah, like the hardware looks cool, but I'm really worried that like if I write code wrong, I'm going to burn something out. The good news is that's probably not going to be the case. Most of the time that you're going to burn something out, you've like hooked power up to something that power shouldn't be hooked up to, and it's the wrong voltage, and it's you know, it's wrong. So as long as you've uh, double checked that, by the way, wherever my box went, that is why this BeagleBone box says dead on it, because I totally did that in the middle of building this project and had to buy another one. So, you know, it doesn't matter how long you've been doing this, you, you will make mistakes, that will happen. Um, but the good news is if you double check, you know, double check the power and stuff like that. And at that point, like the IO is all the same voltage level. So typically, you're probably going to be okay if, if something's just off in your code for the most part. So knowing that, if you have a development board, how do you actually know where to connect the stuff? And to that, you just end up going to essentially the data sheets and the other information that's provided uh, by the manufacturers of, of these devices. And it'll show you, hey, you hook up power here, and you hook up GPIO here, and there's a spy bus one is over here. And this will just go through and tell you um, what the pins are for all of those. And if you need to reconfigure the device tree, there's going to be multiple you know, versions of these documents that say this module comes out of this pin and so on. So uh, you basically just read the documentation, and it's not that difficult from there. And you probably can't see this diagram too well, but you also don't need to either. The point on this one is just take a look at the data sheet. And all of these data sheets are going to have um, diagrams that show you what the pins are where and how to connect them. It's going to have a bunch of descriptions on how to actually use the product and um, more information in there that you uh, probably even care about when you're starting out. So basically, just take a look at the documentation. And for the most part, it'll tell you how to hook everything up. So why work with embedded systems? And this is one of the things that I find really cool about embedded systems. So number one, you've actually got this physical device um, that your user can actually hold and touch and interact with it. And it's just this physical you know, product. It's, it's actually there right in front of you. you know, when you're dealing with software, um, 
your user is a little more distanced from it. So number one, it might be on their screen and you know they're interacting through it uh, with it through you know their their keyboard and their mouse that they bought and all that and like that stuff's not yours and you don't have control over it so um, it's a way that you can get one step closer to the user and and they've got a much closer experience with your product. You have a really wide range of I/O options and you've only seen a handful of those in this presentation, but. Like you saw, uh, like from this project, you know, you've got buttons, lights, displays, sensors. Um, I mentioned you can hook up motors and relays, all kinds of fun hardware that you can add on um, to an embedded controller. You also have a bunch of communication options that go along with that. So, you know, if you're building web software, you're probably dealing with like HTTP and um, Maybe if you're doing something fancy, you get to play with WebSockets, which, you know, HTTP. Um, so, I mean, granted, that's, I'm, I'm beating up, you know, that side a little bit because, you know, you've got MQTT and, and uh, AMQP and all that kind of fun stuff, too, if you get to play with it. But, you know, it's, it's basically like an HTTP world for the most part. Uh, on the embedded side, you've got a whole range of communication options. you got uh, UART, which is kind of like that, uh, you can think of it as like the old school serial communication where you used to have like that nine pin connector that plugged in your mouse or whatever to your computer. Um, there, that's still used uh, not only between devices, but uh, industrial um, use cases still use that uh, all the time as well. So it's still popular there. It's just kind of fallen out on the consumer side with USB. Uh, I mentioned the spy bus in this project, and there's also I squared C, which is another type of chip to chip communication bus. Uh, GPIO, so you've got IO pins, uh, you've got Ethernet, uh, USB, your embedded device can actually act not only as a USB host, but as a USB device that you could plug into your computer. And then you've got radio options like Bluetooth and Zigbee. So a whole wide range of uh, options that you can be able to use to, to talk to different things out there. And of course, like I was touching on, you've got more control with hardware over your user experience. So not only are you not competing with other software that might be running on the user system, uh, like if you're developing web software, you know, you're competing with, uh, you know, maybe even just the other tabs they have open for system resources and stuff like that, and also the user's attention. So if you're, you know, your software is sitting right next to their their YouTube tab or something, you know, they might just want to go off your product for a little bit and go, you know, surf the web on something else, and it's really easy. So. Uh, this gives you not only a way where you're building dedicated hardware specifically for running that one process, um, but you've captured a little more of the user's focus as well. And of course, you also get control over the feel and the form factor of your product. So you can control that physical design, that physical interaction with the user. And then how can you get started with nerves? You know, what's, a, what's a, the next step to be able to do this? Uh, Number one, I recommend coming up with an idea for a simple project that actually solves a problem. So really have like a, come up with a vision behind this. Uh, you can start doing some tutorials and stuff, but you know, honestly, the, the Blink LED tutorial is only gonna get so exciting and capture your interest for so long, right? So uh, that's one of the things that's helped me get through these projects is actually having something a little more useful to me that, um, that gets me beyond those tutorials. Uh, and then also, if you're not like a hardware person already, just keep the hardware minimal and simple when you're starting out. And I kind of even glossed over this as well, uh, where you can even just start out by just running a web server on one of these things if that's really what you're comfortable with. So like, you could start out with that, and then when you've got your web project working on there, then you can start adding you know, some buttons and some other things to it and just kind of build out from there. So there's there's kind of an easy entry point into this, uh, thanks to Nerves being able to run on these products. Next step, of course, is get a BeagleBone Black, uh, or a Pi if you have, you know, have to. I'm just a BeagleBone Black guy. But all this stuff is totally cool with Pi as well. It totally works on that very popular product that's also um, officially supported by Nerves. Check out the Nerves Getting Started guide, because they've written a whole lot of documentation um, on the nerve site around this stuff. And another way, if you get stuck as well, there's a whole uh, nerves community available on the Slack channel as well. And just a little disclaimer that the nerves training channel on Slack 
is not actually for beginner support. I've noticed that's a little confusing thing um, that people jump in there and start asking for support. It's actually, uh, that's a training channel that the maintainers of nerves use for some on-site training stuff. So if you got questions, just ask in the regular nerves channel. The repo for this project is available there. And that's it. So any questions? So yeah, did I consider reversing the direction of the fan? That's a long, there's a long answer to that. So I'm gonna give you the short answer, um, which is I had a grander plan of actually doing, creating some ducting for the fan and all this other stuff so that I actually do the airflow and cool things without having to open the door. Um, there, was a, there was a reflow oven product that actually looks a little more professional that, um, was made by some Chinese company that came out when I was in the middle of working on this. They sell the thing for like 200 bucks now. Uh, so I just kind of ended this project. And that's why some of, some of these parts I've been salvaging here and there and I really wanted to get a talk on this done before it was completely salvaged. Um, but yeah, so I had grander plans for it and uh, never really got around to it, but I definitely did consider it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, I have a question about the dialyzer side. Um, yeah. One of the things you have, should do in dialyzer normally is try to run it in production mode so that you can test dialyzer against the actual code that will be running in production. Um, so I'm curious if, um, so you have certain modules that only run with or could get compiled as dependencies on the build target. Are that, is that partly because they will only compile on that architecture as well, or can they actually compile That's a great question. So, will um, in on the production side, will your modules used in production on the board actually compile down so that you can run the dialyzer over them on the host? And that's actually something I'm playing with right now. So I I'm not sure my answer is right, but my answer is I think so. I and if I've if I've got this in my head right, I think most of the part that's incompatible is like the build root side of having to cross compile uh, like the Linux kernel and everything to the ARM hardware. I think that because you're compiling your actual Elixir code down to the Beam VM and not specifically to the architecture, I think that the production code that's compiled on the host for the target, um, I think you can actually run the dialyzer through that. I think it can trace its way through. So. That's, that's been my guess so far. That's what I've been experimenting with. And so far, that's how it seems to behave. Um, I just don't know about the internals of the Beam and the, how they're doing cross-compiling and stuff enough to give you a 100% answer on that. Yeah, I just think there'd be a possibility of having to do linking for like a, a native NIFS or something like that that might require actual like host-specific code to get the, the, like the under, underlying piece. Yeah. Yes, NIFs have been one of my concerns around that. Um, I've in the new project that I'm working on, it ends up doing some scheduling. So, um, you know, we happen to know somebody around here who's uh, working on an iCal library that compiles NIFs. <laughs> Just to call you out there, Chris. Um, so, yeah, I've actually wanted to try to pull that project in or that library into what I'm working on now and see if this actually works with NIFs. I just haven't had time to do it yet. Gotcha. Yeah. So, question is, if you're if you have to pull in a library that um, depends on something else, um, uh, Javier's example is like Image Magic, then uh, will it pull that in for you? I believe. Yeah. Like like I said, I I didn't actually have to do that with this project, and I haven't done it yet with the latest project. Um, but when you run mix uh, depths dot git uh, for either the host or the target, yes, it does pull everything down. And I believe since it handles cross-compiling for you, my guess is it's going to run it through the cross-compiler. So 
I think you would be OK in that case. Just don't quote me 100% on that. <laughs> Anyone else? What's, cool. What's, the, what's ROC stand for? Reflow Oven Controller. Ah. ROC, my very imaginative name. Um, I, I named this project uh, more like cattle instead of like a pet. So uh, I'm, yeah, using a, a little more of like one of Anthony's, you know, better naming schemes for, uh, for the latest one. But <laughs> Anthony's got cool names he comes up with. But uh, yeah, I just, this was a quick and dirty project to see if I could get it to work. So uh, I didn't spend a whole lot of time on the name, honestly. Uh, the two is because it controls two heating elements. <laughs> Bit of trivia there if you were, you know, wondering about that. Yeah. <laughs> so. Anthony. Would you would you actually use nerves and push it into like a production thing that you're wanting to sell? Or would it make more sense to Oh good question. Yeah, would you use nerves in production? Um totally. Uh Frank the uh, creator of Nerves is actually doing that. There's a couple other projects on the Nerves website that are running in production. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons why I specifically chose the BeagleBone Black, um, because I wanted to be able to, I, I wanted to approach the project with the mindset of, I want to build this for production. So even if it happened to fail, or even if I decided to stop doing the project, which for this one I did, um, I was just approaching it from the mindset of, I want this to run in production, and so I just kind of built everything else under that mindset. So yeah, it totally can. Why did you pick that particular model? Um, for the features, and I believe I saw, I think I might have found this one on somebody else's website as well. Uh, I kind of did my research and checked out what other people were doing with reflow ovens. A lot of people are running these off you know, Arduinos or Pies or stuff like that, just with their own little custom code. And so I just wanted to pick one that looked like it was easy enough for me to hack it apart. So I didn't want one with a bunch of digital stuff on it that I was going to have to get into because I'm making my own digital controller. So I wanted something nice and easy and analog. And you can see over here, it was really easy to chop wires off of things and rewire them to where I wanted them. Yeah. Do you have a version of the program that still works for heating pizza? <laughs> Do I have a version that works for heating pizza? Um, so, or there's a food experiments. There are three food buttons. Experiments that you start, can. stop, and pizza. <laughs> yeah, start, stop, and pizza, right. But you got temperature monitoring, so you can do some interesting like, cooking experiments. You, you could do a cooking experiment. So I will say, if you want to do a cooking experiment, feel free to fork my code. Um, <laughs> once you've done any kind of like soldering on something that like handles food, like this oven or like the frying pan you saw, never, ever, ever eat food off that thing again. Um, there are two types of solder that I didn't go over in this presentation. You've got the lead-free and you've got the leaded. Uh, the leaded solder is definitely poisonous, <laughs> so you don't want to be using, you know, anything that's touched that for food. I use leaded solder typically. It's a lot easier to work with. I don't have to be Rojas compliant, you know, doing small-scale stuff like this, so uh, <laughs> I don't need lead-free yet. Oh yeah, good question. Is there a fume hazard? Um, yeah, so that's one of the reasons why I was thinking of like ducting the fan, for example, so that you could actually run, um, you know, kind of like one of those dryer vents or something out of this thing to be able to exhaust somewhere else. Um, I actually run even just for manual soldering. I just run a little fume extractor on my desk when doing it. If you're doing it long term, like yeah, that is probably a health hazard you want to be, you know, considering. If you're soldering one or two connections. Um, you know, realistically, you'll probably be fine. But yeah, if you're doing it long term, definitely consider the fume hazard factor. Anything else? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did I record any stats on this? Um, a little bit. I. I ended up um, showing this off to somebody else who wanted a little video for one of his students, or for a group of his students. And I 
think this program ended up compiling down to, I want to say 23 or 25 megabytes sitting on that SD card, and that's for everything. So that's the bootloader, that's the Linux kernel, that's the Beam VM, the application, all the dependencies, all that stuff fit in like 23 to 25 megabytes. And uh, um, I haven't actually, you know, since you don't get like top or anything on the board, uh, I didn't run, um, I didn't run any like benchmarking or anything on this, but it ran just fine. Of course, I'm not really taxing the CPU for a project like this. Um, little side note about that performance, especially doing you know web development, you know, uh, uh, by day. That's kind of one of the cool things about Elixir in general is you have just a lot more, uh, a lot smaller resource profile just by using Elixir and running on Beam um, than you would with you know, running Ruby, for example, or something like that. Uh, yeah, that's gonna take a whole lot more memory and uh, resources. And I actually did, uh, I made the Ruby on Rails joke, you know, earlier, but um, on another board, it wasn't a BeagleBone. I actually did try to put a Ruby app on there that was a web server and no luck, it, that, was, that was a bad idea. Um, it, that did not go well. So I, I'm actually really pleased to see that you can do that kind of thing um, with Elixir on this hardware. Uh, with Erlang starting out kind of on the hardware side for telecom equipment, it's probably no surprise, but uh, you know, if you're coming from the software side, it can be really cool to just see like a lot smaller, you know, image sizes and resource usage and a lot just better performance in general. So, yeah. Does reflow solder melt in lower temperature than other types of solder? Like can you put chips or anything else in there that might be soldered uh, yeah, that's a good question. Does reflow solder melt at a lower temperature and can you put anything else in there? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, so if you were just trying to use solder off a spool, or to, to back up, they give you specs depending on like the type of solder you use and buy. There's, um, there's data sheets for the solder that'll tell you, you know, melting points and all that good stuff. Uh, the reflow solder in general, yeah, that was melting around 217 degrees, I think it was on the chart. and if you're using a spool of solder and you're doing manual soldering, like typically I have an iron set around, you know, 325, 350 degrees. Um, so you're gonna have to be at typically higher temperatures to do that kind of stuff. And uh, that also doesn't give you the benefit of like being, you know, sticky for the components to stick to and stuff like that. So uh, if you just, you know, chopped a bunch of solder off a spool and tried to put it in here, things are gonna be, rolling around a little bit, it's gonna be hard to place. You're gonna to have to turn the heat up a lot more. Um, and one of the kind of dangers of reflow soldering with that is if you're dealing with a lot of like delicate plastic components and stuff, you wanna make sure you don't melt your plastic components in the oven. So you kind of need to stay at lower temperatures and you need to be aware of what parts you're actually putting in there. Level use of sunscreen. Yeah, use sunscreen, yes. <laughs> Cool, so yeah, what's the use case for reflow? Um, and that's when you've got, uh, when you're trying to make a board yourself that's more like this, and it's got number one, a lot of components on it in general. Number two, a lot of these little surface mount components that are harder to get to with the iron, and potentially even some of like the BGA components and stuff like that that you can't even get to. Uh, you could get, like if you were trying to make this, you could get a, a stencil from the PCB manufacturer, when you get the board back that you lay over top of the board, you put solder paste on top of that and kind of spread it evenly across there and you're able to pull the stencil off and you have just the right amount of solder on each one of those pads for the components. And then you can just stick your components down there and put it in the oven. And you can do that process a whole lot faster, um, especially if you're trying to crank out, you know, like three of these or five of these at a time or something like that for, for some smaller scale, you know, experimentation or, or handing them off to people if you want to, you know, beta a product or something like that. So you can get a whole lot more of those done that way than you could if you had to sit there with a soldering iron and try to hit all those yourself. Anything else? Cool. Thanks for coming out today, guys.